Welcome to the fifth episode in a legendary series about the English Civil War. In this installment, the New Model Army, we will talk about how Parliament created a different kind of army which won crushing victories over King Charles' forces at the battles of Marston Moor and Naseby. At the beginning of 1644, the war was not going well for Parliament. King Charles held about three-fourths of England and Wales. Some members of Parliament even talked about making peace with the king on his terms. Instead, they chose to create a different kind of army called the New Model Army. Instead of officers being promoted based on their family name or their personal connections, officers would be promoted on merit. The commander of the new model army, Thomas Fairfax, only secured this change after a grueling battle in Parliament, likely in part because this act also barred MPs from commanding troops in the field. While most armies of this era were mercenary and multinational, the new model army would be made up exclusively of Englishmen and Welshmen. Indeed, Parliament would use King Charles' three regiments of French cavalry as propaganda against him, claiming that the king truly fought against England. The New Model Army first wore the iconic English redcoats, which would soon become famous both in Europe and around the world. In those days, the men wore turned-back cuffs, whose color showed what regiment they belonged to. They also had to bring along their own trousers, stockings, and shoes. And while men came and went in the new model army, it retained a core of dedicated officers and battle-hardened veterans who considered themselves to be the army of the living God. The highest-ranking infantry within the new model army were the Pike Infantry, who were considered a better sort than the musketeers who used clumsy matchlock muskets. These matchlocks had a piece of cord soaked in saltpeter held in an iron level called a serpentine. When the serpentine fell upon pulling a trigger, it ignited a flash that lit powder and propelled the bullet. Unfortunately, it also created sparks that could ignite any nearby powder stores and create terrible explosions. These musketeers wore bandoliers with pouches filled with musket balls and priming flasks filled with powder, enough to fire 12 shots before they put down their muskets and picked up pikes. Specialized infantrymen had a more modern type of firearm called the flintlock musket. Since these flintlocks were less likely to spark, the specialized flintlock musketeers were used to guard the powder stores. In spring of 1644, a royal army led by the Marquis of Newcastle was besieged by parliamentary forces in York led by Thomas Fairfax. King Charles sent his nephew, Prince Rupert of the Rhine, to break the siege. Unfortunately, King Charles had not learned that Prince Rupert was simply not much good on the battlefield. Much like his earlier favoritism to George Villiers, King Charles' favoritism to Prince Rupert would cost him and the royalist cause dearly. When he learned of Prince Rupert's army approaching, Fairfax broke the siege to face the oncoming army. The two forces met at Marston Moor, about seven miles south of York. 20,000 rebel infantry faced off against 11,000 royalists. Both sides had about 7,000 cavalry. Prince Rupert hoped that his experienced veterans could carry the day against a parliamentary force that he still saw as raw and untrained, but Fairfax had a surprise in store for him. The battle began with an artillery duel that lasted from about 2 to 3 p.m. When it failed to change the battle formations at all, Prince Rupert thought the battle was over for the day. 
Instead, Thomas Fairfax made the extraordinarily bold decision to attack in a storm at 7.30 p.m. What made this such a brave decision was that powder would not ignite during rain. Oliver Cromwell's cavalry crushed Prince Rupert's horsemen. Indeed, the prince was so impressed by Cromwell's courage that he called him Ironside, a nickname that Cromwell happily adopted. Cromwell then turned to crush the royalist center and drove Prince Rupert's army from the battlefield. Oliver Cromwell would connect better with his men than almost all of his peers. While most of Cromwell's peers read widely and mainly consulted literature related to the parliamentary cause, like Magna Carta, Cromwell mostly read the Bible and could quote it at length. This enabled him to connect with his troops better, as most of them had mainly read the Bible as well. Cromwell was utterly convinced that he knew God's will, and he communicated this fervor effectively to men who regarded themselves as the army of the living God. By spring 1645, King Charles had still not learned his lesson and sent Prince Rupert to the West Country to take some parliamentary garrisons. There he again met the New Model Army led by Fairfax and Cromwell. Rupert was outnumbered again with 8,000 men to the rebels' 13,500. Cromwell convinced Thomas Fairfax to give up the high ground for the purpose of luring Prince Rupert into making an attack against the well-trained parliamentary forces. Unfortunately, things went well at first for the king's men. Prince Rupert was able to beat back Parliament's cavalry, but unfortunately his mercenary soldiers stopped to loot the rebel camp. During that fateful delay, Fairfax's infantry was able to push back the Royalist army. The Battle of Naseby ended with 6,000 casualties on the Royalist side. Prince Rupert lost King Charles' artillery, his baggage train, and worst of all, King Charles' private correspondence. When the parliamentarians read King Charles' letters, they learned that the king had tried to get Irish and European Catholics involved in the English Civil War so they could crush the mostly Protestant rebels. Parliament published these letters and were able to tar King Charles with the brush of treason by noting that he was trying to bring in foreign soldiers to crush his own English subjects. And from there, the war would only get worse for King Charles. We'll find out how much worse in the next episode. I hope you enjoyed this installment of The Legendarium. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.